everybody. Welcome back. You know how we start a Miss Mo show. Let's do it. Laugh and clap. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go with Miss Mo. Two more. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go with Miss Mo. Last time. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go with Miss Mo. Shh. Now, I tell a lot of different stories on this channel. I've got historical stories and folk tales from all over the world and fables and all sorts of things. But I rarely tell a story from my own life. So today I'm going to do just that. Now, when I was in high school, I drove a green truck and we called it affectionately the frog. This thing was older, well, I don't even know how old it was, but it was old. It was mostly green, except where it wasn't all rusted out. And if you looked at it from the back, it was one of those dually trucks, so it had two tires on each side. So it looked like a frog just kind of sitting back on its haunches. And there was no muffler anywhere close to this truck. So you could hear it coming from a mile away. It was old, it belched smoke, it smelled, and it was loud and green, and my sisters hated it. Now, one sister, she would park it across the street at the church so that no one would see it in the parking lot. And then my other sister, she would wait until everyone had gone home doing her homework at school just to make sure nobody saw her getting into the frog. But me, I loved that truck. I thought it was the coolest truck. In fact, I would pop in my tape of the William Tell Overture which was that song that goes and I'd crank the frog stereo as loud as it could go, which wasn't very loud, and I would drive slowly all around the school, past the tennis courts, hey, how you doing? Baseball fields, oh yeah, I'm cool. Honking my horn, blaring my cool classical music. I thought I was a pretty big deal. I loved this truck. And we had a lot of adventures together. Now my senior year, some buddies and I wanted to go to the beach and we wanted to camp on the beach, which is a pretty cool adventure to have when you're in high school. But I had to work. And so my friends were gonna go down early and I said, hey, you know what? I'll throw my camping gear in the back of the truck. I'll leave straight from work and I'll meet you there. So that's what I did. I had all my stuff in my truck, finished work and headed towards the beach, which was two and a half hours or so from my house. And it was going great, wind blowing in my hair, and I'm about halfway to the beach, and it's all nothing around me, middle of nowhere, right? And suddenly the frog starts making noises, and not normal loud frog noises, but like -dunk -huh, groaning, dying frog noises. I'm like, oh no, I don't have a cell phone, I got nothing, and I'm in the middle of nowhere. So I'm going up this hill, and I'm barely making it up this hill, and I can see just as you get to the top of the hill, down at the bottom of the hill, there's a long driveway and there's an old farmhouse. And I think, okay, if I can just make it to the bottom of that hill and uh, that driveway as far as I can, maybe that person can help me. So I get about just over the top of the hill and the tr truck just dies. So I quit, put it in neutral, take my foot off the brake and I'm thinking, okay, I'm just gonna coast down and try not to hit the brake. So as much speed as I can, I'm gonna turn into this driveway. So I'm flying down the hill. I tap the brake, slow it down just enough to take the turn and I make it about halfway up this driveway and boom, it's done. Well, this guy starts coming out of the house because he sees, you know, this truck he doesn't recognize. Big, huge guy, overalls, no shirt underneath, you know, seems like a nice guy. So I go up and I start explaining my situation. My truck broke down. Do you have a phone I could use? And he's like, well, let me take a look at it for you. So he pops up the hood and looks around, bangs some stuff. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know anything about trucks or cars. And he says, oh yeah, well, looks like this and this is something. I don't remember carburetor, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, this thing ain't going to start again. But the nearest gas station or mechanic they're about 20 miles that way and they're closed you ain't going nowhere I'm like, oh man well, what, can i use your phone and call my mom maybe she can come get me he's like listen i know i'm a stranger and maybe your mom's gonna say no but i noticed you got camping gear in the back of your truck i got a really nice barn right here you can sleep in this barn call your mom let them know you're here then tomorrow i'll give you a ride in get your stuff get you fixed up You'll be good to go. So I went in, used his phone, called my mom. She was a little bit nervous, but I was like, mom, I really think it's okay. I've got my camping gear. I'm going to be in the, and he talked to my mom and 
So he was okay. He, she was okay with it. So I was like, okay, fine. So I grabbed my sleeping bag and stuff and he showed me into the barn, nice clean hay. And it was actually kind of a cool adventure. So I'm thinking, oh, this is pretty neat. Right. Um, and he says good night and heads back into his house. Well, I had just started to fall asleep when he came back out in the barn and he says, Hey, I'm really sorry to bother you. I've been thinking about this, but I just feel like I have to show you this thing before you go to sleep. So it doesn't scare you in the middle of the night that sometimes some noises come from under my barn. It's like there are noises under your barn. Oh, okay. So he says, just, I just want to show it to you so you don't panic. All right. So he brings me over and there's this trap door and he opens up the trap door and there are these stairs going down the trap door. He's like, you want to come with me? I was like, everything in me is saying, this is a bad idea. But I'm also really kind of a curious person and I have my pepper spray with me. So I'm like, okay, sure. So I go follow him down these stairs and at the bottom of the stairs, there's this chain hanging down. He pulls the chain and an old light bulb comes on and it turns on all these other light bulbs. Now in this long hallway. Now I'm super curious. So I follow him down this long hallway and we come to a door, but not just any door. It's like one of those really old fashioned bank vault doors with this huge kind of steering wheel from a pirate ship in the middle. So he spins it open, vroom, he spins it, spins it and pulls this vault door open. I'm like, how did you get this vault door in the bottom of your barn? And he said, well, there was a bank in town that burned down, but they had a lot of fixtures left and they were selling them to try to raise money. And I got this really cool vault door for him. I thought it was pretty neat. I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. So then we go into another hallway. There's another chain, turns that light on, another row of lights down this other hallway. So I'm following him down. Now I'm just so curious, probably following this man into the belly under this barn isn't such a good idea, but I'm just so curious. I can't, I can't turn around now. And then we get to another door, but it's not a vault door, at least not an old fashioned one. This is like a glass door, like something out of Mission Impossible under this guy's barn. I know it's crazy. So there's this big glass door and it's got a number pad. I'm like, where did you get this? And he's like, oh, it's from the same barn, from the same bank. I just bought it and I had to do some electrical rewiring and all that stuff, but I got it working great. And so then he puts the code in, 51519. I'm like, okay, so I watched it just in case I needed to make a getaway, you know, 51519. And then woo, that glass door opens and we step into another hallway. Now, this is where things started to get interesting, as if it wasn't interesting already, right? So we go into this next hallway and it smells awful. I mean, it's terrible. There's like this m musky, it smells like a wet, dirty, dog, about a hundred wet, dirty dogs. It was awful. And he turns on the light and we get closer and closer to what I can see is kind of the end of the hallway. And the smell is just getting stronger and stronger. And then I see little gleaming silver lights. And I'm like, what's down there? And, and as we get closer, I realize what it is. It's light reflecting off the bars of an enormous cage. This guy has a huge cage in behind two huge vault doors underneath his barn. I can't believe it. And as we get closer, I can see what the smell was from. It was a gorilla, a gorilla, a huge, huge gorilla. I'd never seen a gorilla this big in my life. It was kind of curled up sleeping kind of in the fetal position like a baby, but it must've been at least seven feet tall. It was a monster. And I look at him, I look at the gorilla. Why is there a gorilla under your barn? This is amazing. Why is there a gorilla under your barn? And he told me the story. He said, listen, I used to be a zoologist and I was a scientist and working labs and all these things. Well, when I retired, I wanted to be a zookeeper. I couldn't be a zookeeper, so I just settled for cleaning and feeding the animals. I mean, I was retired, so I just worked at the Asheville Zoo, which was kind of about an hour away from where we were. I was working at the Asheville Zoo and I'd feed the animals and I named them and I just loved all the animals and it was great. Well, this little gorilla, when it was born, it was so big that it, its mother died giving birth to the gorilla. It was huge, even as a baby. And then when he was only three or four months old, he was so aggressive and huge and strong, he killed the other silverback. He killed his own father. 
So all the scientists and the owners of the zoo said, we can't keep this gorilla. Something terrible is going to happen, and they were going to put him down. We were going to kill him. Well, I had really grown to like this gorilla, and he was really sweet, and I'd fed him, and he was never dangerous to me. So I just wasn't going to let him kill him. So one night, when everybody else was gone, I took my keys, I went into the zoo, I took the gorilla, I gave him a little tranquilizer dart so he'd sleep, and I put him in a big old huge box, I wheeled him out of there, and I never went back. And I moved here, I bought this house in the middle of nowhere, dug out the cellar under the barn, put him in there, got those vault doors from the bank, put him in this cage, and no one has ever, ever seen him before. And he's my secret, I come down and I visit him, he's safe, he's my friend, nothing bad ever happens. And I just wanted you to see him so that if in the middle of the night you heard growling or grunting or knocking around in the cage, you didn't come looking and didn't get surprised and go run and tell the authorities. So I'm just asking you if you can please just keep this a little secret between me and you. And the whole time I'm looking at him, I, I cannot believe my ears. I'd never heard anything so crazy in my entire life. I was like, you want me to not tell anyone that I've seen a seven foot gorilla underneath your barn? And he says, please, they'll kill him. <sighs> Fine. Well, he had me with that. I wasn't going to let him kill this huge gorilla. So I said, fine, fine, fine. This is amazing, and I'll keep it a secret. This is so amazing. And he says, one other thing. What? Do you have a flamingo back there, too? And he said, no. There are no other animals, but I just want you to understand something. You cannot touch this gorilla no matter what you cannot touch it <laughs> that's easy i said listen dude i am not touching that gorilla he'd break me in half that's fine this is amazing i'm gonna go back to bed i'll try not to tell anyone that might be difficult but i am certainly not gonna touch him so he says okay great thanks so we say goodbye to the gorilla and we walk down the hallway, turn off all the lights. We go through the glass door, 51509, and watch him. He closes that, goes through the door, spinny door, opens it up, closes the vault. We turn off all the lights, go up the stairs, closes the trap door. He says, hey, good night. Thanks for being such a good sport. I really appreciate it. I'll make you an amazing breakfast. It's going to be great. Good night. He leaves the barn. And I'm laying there thinking, this is amazing. I can't believe this. This is the coolest thing. There's no way I'm not going to be able to tell anyone. Well, I can't tell anyone. So I'm going back and forth in my mind. And I cannot stop thinking about this huge gorilla, big silverback. I just think all I want to do is go see him one more time. I mean, he didn't say I couldn't go down and see him again. He just said not to tell anyone and not to touch him. And I just, I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I, I got up. I wasn't going to sleep that night. I got up, open the trap door, go down, spin open the huge vault door, turn the lights on, go down, 51509, go through the glass door, go down the hallway, and there he is. Now, now he's rolled over on his back and his arms are kind of open like this and his hand, a few of his fingers are kind of falling through between the bars of the cage, right? And now I can really see him. I mean, his chest, it's like three feet across. I mean, he's just, he's huge. I think I've said that before, right? So he's laying there and he's snoring and his hands are rolled out. I just think, man, this creature is amazing. And then I start to think, he's sleeping. I bet I could touch just his finger, and he wouldn't wake up. I know. I'm not very good at following directions. And so I reach my hand out, and his hand's just laying there open. Huge hand, this big. And I put my finger out, and I just barely touch just the pads of his fingers like this. And have you ever gotten in a car in the summertime? especially in the South, and it's leather seats, and it's just like so hot because it's been baking in the sun. That's how his hand felt. It felt like this hot, hot leather. It was so cool. <laughs> you would have touched him too. It was amazing. And so I just felt it, and then I looked at him, and I pulled my hand back, and he was still snoring away. I thought, I bet I could do it again. I'm just going to do it again. It's going to be fine. So this time he has his whole hand out, and so I, I take just three of my fingers, and I just lay them on his palm, and I can feel his heartbeat. And it's so hot, it's so amazing! And I feel it, and I look at his eyes, and he's still... 
And I think, oh, this has got to be one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. And then his hand closed on my fingers. And with my other hand, I put my hand over my mouth because I don't want to scream. And I look at him and his eyes are still closed. And I think, okay, this is good. He's asleep. But then I thought, but my fingers are stuck in his hand and I don't know what to do. And so my hand is stuck in there. I'm looking at him. I'm looking. I don't know what to do. And I start to panic and think, why am I touching the gorilla? That was so stupid. When suddenly his fingers just open. Oh. And so I slowly pull my hand out. And then I look at him. And then his eyes opened. His eyes opened. And he stood up. And up and up and up. I told he was seven, eight. At that point, I could have sworn he was 20 feet tall. He was huge. And he's just looking down at me. And then he rears back his head and roar, and he roars and he pounds his chest and I start to cry. And just between you and me and whoever watches this story, I may or may not have peed my pants. No shame. I was terrified. And he roars, rah, and I scream, and I start running back. And I'm just waiting, screaming, screaming, screaming. I get to the glass door, and I'm pulling and pulling, and I remember the code. It's 51519, and I pull the code, and I close it, and I'm running. And as I'm running away, I hear the metal. He's coming through the, he was coming through the bars. He was pulling the cage apart to get to me because I had touched his hand. And then I hear the glass shatter. This gorilla was chasing me down the hallway and he broke the glass door. And so then I get to the vault door and I'm spinning it open and I go through and I close it and I spin it closed and then I hear boom, boom, and he's on the other side of the vault door and I'm just praying that it holds. And I run, I ran up the stairs and then crash, I hear the vault door just boom, break down like nothing. And I run up the stairs, I close the trap door and I'm running to my car. And of course I'm screaming all the way to my truck, help! But I'm also thinking to myself, I don't know that this guy's gonna help me. If it's between shooting me and shooting the gorilla, I wasn't really sure which we was gonna do, to be perfectly honest. So I'm screaming, help, help, and I'm just praying, please, please let this truck start just one more time. I just need it to start one more time. And I'm screaming, I look over, and there's the man. He's come out, and he has a gun, but he's looking at me, he's looking at the gorilla, he's looking at me, he's looking at the gorilla, and I can tell. He doesn't know what he's going to do. So I'm, please, truck starts. So I get in the truck. I rev it up and it starts. <gasps> Hallelujah. It started. The truck started. And I was so, so grateful. I put it in reverse. I start backing up. The gorilla is coming at me. And I'm just crying. Well, please. So I'm backing up. And then the truck dies. It's done. And I'm just crying. This is going to be the end of me. See, this is where you don't need to panic. Because look, I'm alive. So obviously the gorilla didn't eat me. Okay, but I'm just screaming and I'm crying, oh no, please, and I'm honking the horn and I'm waving at the man like, shoot the gorilla, shoot the gorilla, I'm gonna die. And the gorilla gets to the door, and of course I'd locked it, but that wasn't gonna do much. And so he rips the door off the hinges, and I'm crawling on the other seat of the side of the truck, and I'm trying to get away. Now he doesn't lift the truck up, he's not King Kong, but he do, he, he can't lift the truck up, he's sort of, he's sort of bent it and tilted it and shook it. So I'm trying to hold on and then I slide out. So I slid down and I'm laying on the ground and the king, this huge gorilla is over me and I'm crying and the man's getting closer and the gorilla's looking at me and he's looking at the, at the guy and he's looking back at me and he's just and I'm just crying and his hands come in like this and he's coming around my neck and I'm like this is it. He's gonna crush my head like a grape. And his hands get closer and closer then he takes one finger like and he puts it on my forehead and he says, tag, you're it. <laughs> All right, that's the story of how I met that gorilla. I won't tell you what happens next. You can figure it out. What do we do now? <laughs> Let's end it. Miss Mo, Miss Mo, Miss Mo has got to go two more, Miss Mo. Ms. Mo, Ms. Mo has got to go. Last time, Ms. Mo, Ms. Mo, Ms. Mo has got to go. Bye! Now, you may be wondering if that story was true. I am offended that you would think it's not. I'll let you decide if you think that story is true or not. 
I guess you'll have to ask my mom. Have a great day and I'll see you again for another story soon. Bye!